Hello, everyone, and welcome to Next Level Leadership, a live stream series to support leaders during this crisis. In our last episode, we learned how to act with intent. Warren summarized with three things. Number one, intentionality matters in all things, large and small. Number two, intentionality of thought plus action equals outcome. And three, intentionality is the first step in achievement. What a great episode. Thanks so much for being there. Today is episode eight, making conscious choices. Warren Rustan will share ways to make conscious choices during this crisis to continue the momentum of your life. Each week we introduce Warren. <laughs> Many of you have seen Warren speak or attended events and it always goes something like this. Here's Warren. For those of you that haven't seen or met Warren Rustan, he is the former CEO of Providence Service Corporation, served as a member of the board of directors for over 50 public, private, and non-for-profit companies. Warren served as appointments secretary to President Ford, global chairman of WPO, co-founder and dean of faculty at the Entrepreneurs Leadership Academy, countless awards, Sports Hall of Fame, White House Fellow, but the award he treasures the most is Father of the Year in his hometown of Tucson, Arizona. This is a conversation. Please post your questions for Warren in the chat and also tell us where you're joining from. We encourage you to share Next Level Leadership with your teams, with your communities. Thank you for all being here. We are all in this together. Here's Warren. Thank you so much. I'm grateful to be with you again. These conversations are invigorating for me. I hope they're helpful to you. I hope in answering the questions that you pose, we can share together some thoughts about how we move from where we are to where we want to be. Now, this is a complex, challenging, and difficult time. We can't make light of this. Serious things are happening. I was mentioning to Winnie before we started that my telephone log indicates that I've had over 400 calls from entrepreneurial leaders from around the world since the last week in January. All concerned, all challenged. Some have called back more than once. We've worked on their challenges and their problems. We've had discussions and I hope in some way that I've been helpful to them as a listening voice, uh, listening and voice, I should say, to their concerns and difficulties and challenges. Today, we're gonna to be talking about making conscious choices, particularly important during this period of the virus and given the circumstances and situations in which we find ourselves today that are so remarkably different than where we were just 60 or 90 days ago. If you think to yourself, the kinds of decisions that you were making 90 days ago, which would have been the third week in January, yes, we'd heard about the virus, but didn't really know anything about it. We just weren't ready to understand it in the way we do today. So think about those decisions while we're here together, the ones you were making that 60, 90 days ago. Now think about the decisions you're making today. Jot down the difference. What are the differences between the choices you were making then and the choices and decisions you're making now? Jot down a few words, put it in the chat box, let us respond to it, ask questions about it. And then think and push forward the kinds of choices that you'll be making over the next weeks and months as all of this becomes even more clear for us than it is today. I keep here near my desk this bronze, small bronze, that you can see. It's of an eagle. And the title of this, Eagles Are Not Found in Flocks. Eagles are giant birds, resolute, proud. They live generally in high altitudes. Uh, they marry for life. But they're very solitary. It reminds me of entrepreneurial leadership. Many of you who are on and in this conversation with me today are entrepreneurial leaders, strong leaders in your own right, who've been dealt a bad deck of cards in many ways. And yet that pride, that strength that's made us successful leaders is often called into questions with the choices that we've made. And Eagles entrepreneurs, are not found in flocks. It's often solitary. The choices we make, the decisions we make are often done alone. And while we can talk with them about other people, um, that loneliness, that difficulty, that challenge, that gut-wrenching experience sometimes 
that we have to make is very hard. During this time, many of those choices seem difficult at best. And we wake up every morning thinking decisions, 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 more and more choices. The decision we were making 60 or 90 days ago at the top of a great economy around the world with a few exceptions uh, is now changed. And financially and economically, everyone is being challenged. The choices we were making them perhaps were less complex. They were more simple, they were more focused. Uh, perhaps they were more or less important than the decisions we make today. But it seems like the choices we're making today are having more impact and more long-term consequences than those we were making just 90 days ago. I think all of this choice making is heightened by our self-awareness. And it's never more obvious of being self-aware than we're in the middle of a crisis because it challenges what we believe, how we think, how we process, what our values are. And I think choices continuously, good and bad times, need to be based on values that we make value-based decisions. But we lose sight of that sometimes as we get into tough times or even in great times. And we tend to think our, or believe that our thinking needs to be a different way. If we can consistently make choices around values, we have a much better chance to be successful. Value-based decision-making should be driving all of our decisions, all of the time, whether we're thinking of our family, our business, our community, or even ourself. But our basic choices are in those four buckets that we've always talked about. We should also decide in making choices, what are the non-negotiables? What are those things that we simply will not vacillate on? We will not compromise. Those are very important in making choices and in making the choices that are most critical at this time during the crisis. You know, there are some choices that can be made just once. Marriage, family, drinking, alcohol, drugs. We can make that choice once. I recall as a young athlete when I was 16 years old, some of my teammates occasionally would uh, test alcohol and maybe even do some drugs. And I got to thinking that for myself, at least, I wanted to compete at a very high level. And so I chose not to do that. And even to this day, I've never had alcohol or drugs. But if you try to take away my Dr. Pepper or my chocolate, then we're going to have a fight. You see, we each make choices, all of which could be addictive, all of which could be compromising for our health. We just make them in different ways. And that's really true today. Each of us are making really important choices about our families, our communities, and our businesses, and they're different. A lot of people think that we're in the same storm. We may be in the same storm, but we're really reacting differently because our individual storm is different and unique from all others. So what kinds of things should we be thinking about? Well, first of all, our circumstance now requires us to have a new focus around choice making. Making good choices is, is tough in a good situation. It's even more complex and difficult in a hard situation. We have this heightened awareness, awareness, but we have reduced optionality. We just have fewer choices today than we had 90 days ago. And the choices probably are going to get harder before they get easier. I'm reminded of a woman that I know well and who's a really dear friend, and I've come to appreciate for her strengths. Her name is Natalia Matviva, and Natalia was born in Russia. I first met her when I went to Moscow to speak to a conference, and I found her to be engaging and smart and such a great leader. I had dinner after the conference with her husband and, and Natalia, and, and we had such a great conversation about geopolitical events and personal lives and where things were going. You see, she had a really interesting experience growing up that perhaps some of us can relate to. She and her family, her mother was a doctor, a physician, her father a ship captain. She has a twin sister. And when they were very young, three, four years old, they moved to a city in Russia called Chernobyl. They were only going to be there six months. But during that time, their Chernobyl nuclear reactor melted down, spreading radiation, which ultimately circumnavigated the globe but it literally destroyed everything within a radius of Chernobyl that was stretched for hundreds of miles. Animals, people, foliage. 
there weren't many survivors. The morning after the incident, troops from the Soviet Union came into Chernobyl to extricate those and, and evacuate those who were still alive. Natalia, her twin sister, mother, and father were among those who survived. Their life since then and shortly thereafter was, of course, health checkups and checking for radiation and not knowing if they were going to make it, not knowing what their life expectancy was going to be. It was a challenging time, but it created focus on the part of Natalia and her family, which was remarkable. She went on to university. She then started a gaming company. She had some of the most popular games in the world. She chose to sell that after several years and did very well. And then she took up her next and most important passion, which is to develop a healthcare app, which is going to de de detect anemia in small children around the world. And she's progressing with that very well. You see her crisis narrowed her choices and in narrowing her choices, increased her focus. So as we think about this crisis, it narrows our choices, but increases our focus. So making conscious choices, deliberately choosing, not getting swept along with the crowd, not developing the herd mentality, but making deliberate choices about our lives is ever more important and certainly critical for us today in this pandemic that touches our lives in this way. So the second important step in this process is choices can simplify and focus our lives. The first step in making conscious choices, as I said, is choices can be made just once. The second step then is choices can simplify and focus our lives in ways that we couldn't contemplate previously. So what choices can we make today, sitting here in the middle of this pandemic, not knowing for sure what the future is going to be? What choices can we make about our families, our business, our community and ourselves? As leaders, as entrepreneurs, as strong people in our families and communities, how can we help in this process? First in our family, why don't we make some choices around creating vision boards and family vision statements and family value statement. We have more time with our family now than ever before. Why don't we spend some time really thinking that through and delivering on those tools that are going to hold our family together for a long period of time? Why not in our business community, won't we begin focusing on profitability rather than driving revenue? Because profitability will mean more cash. And we know that to get through this crisis, we'll have to create more cash. But importantly, beyond the crisis, we're going to be in a position to actually be more profitable and generate more cash as we make the transformation to new businesses and or extending our current business or even discovering new businesses if we've lost ours at this point in time. And what about the community? What could we do in the community? Well, First, why don't we concentrate on impact in the community, conscious impact, making conscious choices, make conscious impact. So in the community, rather than spread, spreading ourselves too thin, rather than writing too many checks, rather than being engaged in too many activities, why don't we narrow our focus? And why don't we really drive impact in the community engagement that we have? If we do that, we have a better chance. And why don't we embrace the notion that our spouses, significant others and family should join us in those community activities, wherever we find them. And right now it may be driven from our home and from our neighbors and what we can do in close proximity to ourselves. But there are things that we can still do in the community that will benefit others. And we all know the community is hurting. So the third step in this process of making conscious choices is making choices knowing that, if, that, if, that they affect the lives of others. Choices always affect the lives of others. Even if we think we're making choices in a solitary way, we know that that has a ripple effect that affects the lives of others. George Gann, my good friend from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, said something a couple of years ago that I like very much that as we close before questions, he said, does what we have determine who we are or does who we are determine what we have. In this time, right now, 
at this moment in our lives, who we are, who we become, will determine what we have. We're happy to take your questions. I look forward to it. And I hope in some small way, our discussion today is helpful to you around making conscious choices. And as we answer these questions, I'll enjoy engaging with you. Thank you. Winnie? Thank you, Warren. We have um, Guatemala, uh, San Francisco, New York, Kuala Lumpur, Cancun, Vermont, Tanzania, Kansas City, Chicago, Greece, New Orleans, Colorado, to share a few. Bahrain. Uh, first question is, um, how do the choices we make today compound our ability to get through this crisis? Well, I think it is uh, an exponential effect for us, right? And the notion is that when we make choice, it relieves us of some of the burden of thinking about choice. Because in the end, in our gut, in our intuition, uh, in our brain, we have the ability to make these choices, which I think then allows us to create the path forward. And in creating the path forward, we see the future and begin to act in the future in ways that just thinking about it, just digesting and just continually ruminating about it uh, hurts us because it robs of us of emotional energy. It robs us of strength. So getting to decision points, getting to choice is really important in the process. As I mentioned, never let a good crisis go to waste. Crisis is inevitable. Adversity is always in our life. We're always going to be challenged. Therefore, it's just a matter of how we react to it and how we think about it. So get our arms around it, figure it out as best we can, and then begin to make choices moving forward best based on the best available information that we have. And when we do that, we begin to shift our focus from our current state, which is really hard, to our future state, which is going to be infinitely better. Thank you. <clears throat> what kinds of choices simplify our lives and what choices complicate our lives? Good question. I think choices that simplify our lives are having a great marriage and a great relationship with a significant other and having someone close to us and making sure that's a great relationship. If we have children, embracing our children as special and unique gifts to us and, and love them for who they are, laugh at them, have fun with them, laugh with them, have games and activities with them and understand that families are together for a relatively short period of time as a whole. And then children are going to move off and we're going to be left with a relationship that we have to make great. So how they simplify our lives is by taking those simple things that are close to us and making them the best we can possibly make. All right. Make our relationships just great with our friends the same way. Let's stop making judgment. Let's be kind. Let's be tender. Let's be thoughtful. Let's be all the things we want to be and how we want to be treated ourselves. So if we take that off the table, it seems to me that our lives are just inherently better. Some things that we decide can complicate our lives going forward as well, right? There are choices that we will make, some correctly, some incorrectly, that may have future consequences that we can't see now, but we're making decisions on the best information we have. For some, it's believing that this is a short-term issue and it's going to be fixed in just a few weeks. And so we make choices about how we're going to spend cash or we're going to handle our employees or we're going to be with our family in our homes. And some have embraced the notion that it's going to be over in just a few weeks and we'll move on and be back to normal. I'm not sure normal as we knew it in the past will ever happen again. There may be a new normal and we'll adapt and get accustomed to that, but it's a ways down the road. I'm of the opinion, and I could be frequently wrong, as, as everyone knows I am, but this notion that I think it's, this is going to extend for a while. And I think it's going to be out there. I don't think it's 90 days and over. We may get, may get a break in the virus and the spread of the virus, whether that's in the summer or for other reasons. But I think this virus will be with us for a while and therefore it'll be complicated. But you know what? There'll be other viruses. There'll be other catastrophes. There'll be other difficulties. It's the nature of the human experience. So make, be comfortable with the choices we're making today so that it doesn't complicate us down the road. I've been asked a lot, well, what time frame, Warren, are you working with in your personal business and personal life? And I told someone just before I got on this in this conversation with you today, we've adopted 24 months, two years. We hope within that two years, we'll have broad scale testing. So we know who has the disease 
and we'll have a vaccine that can treat the disease. We, I believe we need to have both of those to be comfortable and sure. Now, will we go out and socially interact? I believe we will. Will we keep our distance? I do. Will people wear masks? I think they will. Will we still be aware that a virus is out there and there are many who are asymptomatic and we don't know who they are? We will for a period of time. So I, we've adopted a two year time frame and we've made all of our plans around that two years. Now, could that complicate our lives? It could if it extends beyond two years, absolutely. If it's shorter than two years, it will not complicate it. It'll make it more simple. I hope that's helpful to you. So you mentioned two years and um, earlier in the conversation, you also were talking about vision boards and um, tying this with a question from Adam Glickman, he is asking about the process of using our core values as filters to make conscious choices. Is there something you would suggest in terms of helping us look into the future with those core values to get through those 24 months? Well, I hope our core values are so solid that they, we don't change them, that they're, they're the non-negotiables in our lives, Adam. I hope that that's the case, and I'm sure it is with you is that we've decided this is what our lives are about. These, this is what we embrace and therefore this is how we live. I don't think that complicates or changes anything about the future because our core values are about how we exist with each other in the journey, right? Whatever that journey may be. And so I, I believe that the core values, making decisions based on those core values, accepting the fact there are non-negotiables will, will be helpful. And, um, and I think that will, uh, make sure that we get through that future in a wholesome, healthy way, completely intact. One of the things I think with vision boards for children and adults is to reflect those values on those vision boards with the goals that we want, those things that we're trying to achieve, make sure that they fit within the context of the values that we have. Adam, I hope that answers your question. Uh, if it doesn't, please come back and we, and, uh, with another note and we'll answer it before we close today. Thank you. So Dan Leonello asks, um, some of us are making choices that make us stronger during these challenging times. What are your suggestions for communicating with others who are stuck because their businesses have disappeared? And there are a lot of people who are in that category right now. A lot of people in this conversation live right now who are wrestling with the notion that they may not have their business going forward or it may already have closed its door. And I'm aware of so many that have gone through that really difficult thing. I think some of us uh, are more comfortable making choices in crisis, perhaps because we're older, because we've been through it many times before. But for those who are going through it for the first time or in a radically different time, um, I'd encourage those of us who have made choices more comfortably and easily to reach out to those who are struggling with it and to be sure we share whatever knowledge we have, to be sure to be a good listener. Oftentimes people who are struggling just wanna be heard. They, they just want us to listen. I've had many conversations in the last 90 to say where I didn't do a lot of talking, but people did a lot of talking to me. And they wanna be heard and they wanna get that frustration out. And it's a little bit like being that eagle, right? It's being alone in making decisions and they need to hear from peers, equals, others who have gone through it, that it's okay. It's okay to struggle. It's okay to feel this way. It's okay to lose everything. I've lost everything in my life twice. One time we were down to cashing in a coin collection of my wife's in order to buy groceries. I understand what losing everything is. And it's the hardest place to be. And losing everything sometimes is losing a loved one. That's the most difficult thing, someone in our family. Losing our possessions is less difficult, right? I think it was Billy Graham who said, if you lose money, you've lost nothing. If you lose your health, you've lost something. If you lose your integrity, you've lost everything. Our values, our integrity are critical, whether we have a lot or we have a little. And we need to coach those who are reaching out to us to appreciate and understand that getting through this with our integrity, our values is the most important thing. Thank you, Warren. Um, integrity and values, this follows that perfectly. And uh, Safa Sharif is asking about judgment. And you were talking about um, you know, being kind and not judging people. How do you 
uh, prevent yourself from doing that or falling into that trap. Yeah, I think, you know, we've lived in a very judgmental group of societies around the world for quite a long period of time. And sometimes when we're having material success, we become even more judgmental of others, right? Because we think uh, that perhaps we're better than others or that we're more successful than others and somehow that our opinions really matter. I think we have to apply our forum experience, right? That, that we get in different organizations using gestalt, gestalt methodology, which is to experience share rather than make judgments. Listen carefully to others. You see, none of us have the same life experience. 7.5 billion of us on planet Earth today, we're all genetically different. We have different DNAs. We've had different life experience. And so every perspective that we bring to everything is unique with that individual in that setting, in that moment in time. It's just unkind for us to make a judgment about others in that respect. Do I ever do it? Yes. Have I found myself doing it? Sure. Right. I got the same weakness that everybody else has, but I work really hard at it. So here's what I do. I try to remind myself when I'm hearing about somebody doing something, whether that's in politics, it's in private life, it's a competitor, whatever it is. To say to myself, what would I do in the same circumstance? How would I feel in the same circumstance? Would I want someone to make a judgment of me in that circumstance? And the answer is always no. And so I try not to do that. Um, I'm fallible and imperfect, and I often fall into that trap as well. But I battle to get out of it as quickly as possible because it's not, it shouldn't be our human experience to make light of or judgment of others who are on their particular journey. We're just on different journeys. It's like this storm that we're in right now called the pandemic. We're all in that storm, but we're in different parts of the storm. We're feeling the winds differently, the waves differently, right? The force of the storm is different for each of us. For some, it's financial. For some, it's family. For some, it's death. We're all feeling it differently. So let's not make judgments about others. Let's work really hard at being kind. And let's understand that our vulnerability needs to shine through and our humility needs to shine through, right? Um, let's be an example to others about how to treat others. Thank you, Warren. Uh, Miranda Nyman, uh, she's asking about actually a, a journey that you were on with her um, at the Regional Leadership Academy in Kenya. And she's talking about climbing that volcano. And she said, we made a conscious choice to keep going. How do we inspire our teams to keep going even though they are anxious and fearful? Well, I think using that volcano is a really good example. Uh, when we planned that activity, uh, none of us had seen the volcano and none of us knew it. We thought there'd be a path up. We thought it would be an easier thing. But as you'll recall, in that situation, in that circumstance, we actually uh, had no path. Uh, there were signs of game, wild game everywhere. Um, and it was a very serious uphill climb. What everyone thought was going to be 20 minutes uh, was an hour and 20 minutes. For some, it was a couple of hours just to get to the top. What we learn from that is that we can overcome anything. No matter how steep our climb, no matter what volcano we're going up in life, we can get there. We have to put one foot ahead of the other, always. Never stop climbing because life is a giant climb. It's volcanoes, it's stairs, it's adversity and challenges, right, as we said before. And so this notion that we've had the experience of climbing the volcano, we can share with others about how hard it was and how difficult it was. And the only way we made it was to continue the climb. The only way people get to Mount Everest is to put one foot ahead of the other with intervals of about 10 to 15 to 20 seconds because they're so tired, but they climbed at the top of Mount Everest. My experience with hard times, challenging times, difficult times is that if I just get up, show up, dress up, we have a chance to make it. The when I find it difficult is when I give in to my feelings of despair, of difficulty, uh, of not feeling good enough, not being good enough. If I give in to that, then putting one foot ahead of the other is really difficult. So share the experience we had together. Share the climb. Tell them about that 76-year-old man that got there to the top first, okay? And tell them what happened in the process and know that all of us can make the climb. 
Mm, thank you. Lauren, Tom Cullen is, is asking questions about uh, the 24 month plan that you put together with your family. And he says, first of all, he says prayers to you and your family. Thank you. Um, he says, um, how often um, are you regrouping with your family to do things such as making that 24 month plan? And specifically, do you have a structure for those conversations and meetings? So first, what we did was we had a family meeting and we sat down and said, okay, this is upon us. This is going to be hard. What are we going to do? And we talked about every large and small thing. How do we keep our family together? How do we keep organized and so forth? You may recall that I said there were 12 things that we talked about that were really important in our family plan. And I'll, I'll get those for you um, so we can talk about them. The first was how do we protect our family? The family category was the most important category. How do we protect our family? The second thing is how do we secure our family? Those are two different concepts, right? How do we secure our family? And then the last, of course, was how do we organize our family during this time of crisis because we don't know how long it's going to be. So that had to do with online learning and education for the kids. It had to do with recreation. It had to do with all of the activities that a family is engaged in. So those were the three principles. We chose three principles in each bucket. The next part of the family meeting was what are we going to do in business? And you'll recall, Tom, on a previous episode, I talked about focus on cash, focus on revenue and focus on people. Those are the things that become critical in sustaining a business during a really serious crisis. The third part of the plan was in what are we going to do about the community? Because even though we're going through a harsh time ourselves, we still have obligations in the community that we have to recognize and we have to do. And entrepreneurs everywhere know of which I speak. We have an obligation to the broader community. And so we said, what do we do? Well, first of all, we have to serve others. We have to find a way, even though we're confined, to serve other people. And then we have to idea share with others in the community about how to get through this crisis and how to help people because the not-for-profits have been hit particularly hard during this period of time because their source of revenue has dried up as well. People are not donating as much. They're more willing to give time, but not having as much income themselves to give the sources of in income for not-for-profits and, and NGOs has dried up. And so we have to try to help them as best we can. And then how do we create strategic partnerships is the third point. How do we create those strategic partnerships with members of our community? It could be, it could be our neighbors, right? It could be our larger neighborhood. It could be the broad community in which we live. And Tom, I know you live in a very small town, right? In upstate New York. And you, you're always thinking about your community in great ways. And so partnershiping with your community is gonna be really important. And then the last issue is how do we take care of ourselves? Because in the end, we can't do all of this and lose ourselves in the process. Three quick things. Dr. Jenny Evans has spoken eloquently about this. One, work out every day because it gets rid of anxiety, apprehension, and fear. Secondly, eat well. Don't get the chocolate. Don't get the Dr. Pepper. Be sure that you're getting good food, okay? And third, we have to sleep well. Have a process for going to sleep. Have a way of doing it. I hope this is helpful to you, Tom. I think it's important. And we looked out and then we recalibrate every 30 days or more, or nearer if we have to, sooner if we have to, right? And if something comes up that changes that. So every 30 days, we have another family meeting and we sit down and say, how are we doing? What do we have to change? How's the future looking to us? So I hope that's helpful, Tom. And um, I hopefully, hopefully you and your beautiful daughters do really well during this time. You're a terrific father. You know how much I admire you. So thanks for the good work you're doing. Uh, the question, Warren, is where are you looking for information to inform you on what's happening in the world and what our future looks like? Yeah, I think that's a really good question because I had said it all along during these conversations that we need to have one or two, three good sources of information that we trust, right? That we trust. <clears throat> and I found that there, there are some reasonable sources. Uh, in the United States, it's the Center for De Disease Control. They tend to have a good handle on what's going on. Um, the World Health Organization, although it has gotten battered a bit by the US government at least, they seem to be, have, they have a lot of research and information and access to knowledge about what's going on around the world. So it's not just about our little focus in the United States, but it's about what's happening in the globe. So those two sources seem to be pretty good. And then I always try to have one source, an individual, in whom I have great trust and respect, 
that knows this subject infinitely better than I do. And there's a physician who's genius level guy that I've known for 40 years, who's in the middle of this right now. And I talk with him and I trust his judgment. And so those are the sources that I use. Try to find those sources for yourself. Try not to engage in speculation, fear mongering, mongering, a rumor, um, all that kind of stuff. And don't spread rumors. Unless you know factually, don't talk about it. <clears throat> because people look at you as an entrepreneurial leader and they give value to what you say. So be careful about what you say. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Warren. Last question um, and just a few other uh, spots. We have someone from Perth, uh, Canada and Nova Scotia. Um, what can I do to be a better eagle to everyone around me? Um, example is the best model. Example is always the best model. When I look at an eagle flying or soaring, right, which is what entrepreneurs do, entrepreneurs soar, eagles soar. Um, I look at strength, commitment, dedication, uh, power, conditioning, all of those kinds of things. I think of what an eagle is the symbol of. And therefore, I think that we have to be that to others. Uh, our How we live our lives in time of crisis will send tremendous signals to everyone, our children, our extended family, <clears throat> our friends, our colleagues at work. They're looking to us. Do we crack under the strain? Do we collapse under the burden of being a leader? Or are we strong and resolute? Are we committed to finding answers? Are we trying to do the right things? Are we modeling the behavior that we want to see in others? When we model that behavior, we become the better leader, the better self. I believe so strongly in what you're doing as leaders. I believe you have power beyond your belief, capacity beyond what you think you're capable of doing. You need to exercise that now. You need to stay in the moment and understand it, but look to your future because that future is going to decide who you're going to become. And we're all in the state of becoming during this crisis. So do your level best. Let's review for a second the three things that are going to help us make conscious choices. First, some choices can be made only once and we can forget about them from that point forward. Second, many choices can simplify and focus our lives. And third, our choices affect the lives of others. If we'll practice those three choices, we'll be in good shape. On Thursday morning, we're going to be talking about engaging in a cause greater than yourself. It's something I've been looking forward to sharing with you. I hope you'll join us. We'll have a great time. I'll try to answer as many of your questions online as I can. Thanks for being with us. I look forward to seeing you on Thursday.